Um, as I have been introduced, um, I'm a molecular biologist with a very strong focus on the field of epigenetics. And I hold a PhD in biotechnology, but I'm also the founder and CEO of a company called Novogenia, which uh, has become over the last 10 years, Europe's leading uh, nutrigenetic laboratory. So uh, we do nutrigenetic testing. So just, um, just for transparency, I am going to be a little bit biased because I have been developing nutrigenetic testing for the last 10 years, as well as uh, personalized supplementation uh, strategies and, and technologies. But my aim is to give you a broad overview of where the science is today, what the principles are of personalization, and what the advantages and disadvantages of, of certain delivery methods are. Okay, I'm going to start with a very bold statement uh, of which I believe to be true from, from my last 10 years of experience. And that is, if you take 20 different nutrients, and those might be vitamins, minerals, um, trace elements, statistics, statistically, one of them is likely to harm you, two are going to have no effect, and the rest are going to be at the wrong dose. Now, I know a lot of you are health professionals and uh, you have nutritional training, so feel free to disagree. Um, however, I want to spend the next 20 minutes or so to uh, give you a little insight of how I came to this conclusion. So when we talk about personalization, the principle is uh, quite straightforward. We take personal information, we use that in a certain way to come to a certain outcome. And depending on what information we use, whatever that may be, uh, we come to a different outcome. So the most straightforward way of personalization is uh, lifestyle. So obviously the kind of things that I eat, how much exercise I do, um, how much I go out into the sun, all of this has a certain impact on how my body uh, uses nutrients and so on. So for example, um, there's uh, quite a strong link with a lack of sunlight. So when people don't go out into the sun and the UV rays, um, doesn't get, uh, don't get the chance to touch the skin. So the body cannot produce vitamin D3. So people who do not go out into the sun have a higher uh, likelihood of being vitamin D deficient. Other aspects such as avoiding dairy could lead to a lower calcium intake. Um, if you're vegan or vegetarian, you're more prone to become vitamin B12 deficient. And if you generally don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, you're likely to be deficient in certain vitamins. Now, this is, this is probably the easiest way of personalizing because you, you essentially do a questionnaire. However, it's probably also the least scientific. So there is a link, but uh, just because a person doesn't go out into the sun doesn't necessarily mean that they're very deficient. So there is some merit in using this kind of information for recommendations. Um, however, uh, yeah, as a scientist, there are, there are better ways. Certainly, uh, it does make sense to consider it, but there are other aspects of uh, personalization that need to be considered. So lifestyle is, is the first one. So just doing a questionnaire, finding out what the person's needs are. The next one are blood levels. This is a quite common approach. So doctors or nutritionists would do this. They do a uh, blood test and just check if the nutrients are within the norm. And the general way of approaching this is if there's a deficiency, you uh, make sure that the intake is increased. So you would eat more of a certain nutrient um, through changing the diet or you could supplement with that uh, substance. And then the other approach is if the level is normal, so within normal ranges, you would find it to be okay. And generally, um, doctors or nutritionists would usually say, okay, no, no action needed. So essentially, blood levels are a good way of finding out if you have deficiencies. However, uh, from genetics, we find that um, this is not necessarily absolutely true. So I want to look into one further level of personalization where maybe having a normal level of certain nutrient in the blood is still not, um, uh, still not sufficient. So we're going to look into the genetic blueprint, um, which essentially contains a lot of information of what kind of nutrients my body actually needs, what it is able to metabolize, and uh, even what kind of nutrients could be harmful. So those are the three main areas that are being used for personalization by various companies. Now, uh, genetics is my main field, so I'm going to mostly talk about genetics. Um, for anyone who can't remember their biology lesson, a very quick uh, 
a quick recap. So the human body consists of around 50 billion individual cells and every cell has, an, almost every cell has a nucleus and those contain chromosomes, so these X shapes that we all know from television. And if you look at a chromosome in more detail, you find that it's a very tightly wound thread. And this thread is the DNA double helix, this winding ladder. And in there, you will find the genetic code and that only consists of four different genetic letters. So A, T, G, and C. And by only using different combinations of these letters, um, biology or nature is able to build the whole uh, recipe for a human body. And now if we talk about genes, genes are certain regions in this genetic code. So for example, an enzyme gene um, would mean that this genetic code in this area here um, uh, contains the instructions for the body to tell it how to, for example, digest lactose. So sugar that is uh, present in milk. Now, um, that brings me on to another, another thing. So a lot of scientists, a lot of uh, clinicians agree that nutrigenetics is something of the future. So in the future, we're going to know what kind of food is good for us, bad for us. Um, we are at least going to have the option of uh, eating according to our genes. Now, um, before we dive into uh, the supplements, I just want to put a question mark on this. Is this really a thing of the future? And for this, I want to um, go back 20,000 years. At that time, um, they were all, were all humans were still in Africa and, and Europe. And at that time, we all were hunters and gatherers. And essentially, that meant we went out with bow and arrow and we hunted deer. Uh, mammoths were already extinct by then. So uh, we were hunting for food or, and gathering plants and so on. And a baby uh, used to have access to breast milk. So this is a standard cave, uh, caveman baby. And breast milk does uh, contain lactose. And lactose is essentially a big molecule. It consists of two smaller sugars which are attached to each other. And uh, lactose itself, if it goes into the intestine, and this is supposed to show you the intestine, um, it's too large to be absorbed into the bloodstream. So for the baby to be able to digest it, we first need a certain gene called the lactase gene, which tells the body how to build an enzyme, a small molecular scissors that splits lactose into the smaller sugars, glucose and galactose. And those are small enough molecules that they can be absorbed. So every baby needs this gene to be able to tolerate lactose and digest it. And then it's a very good food source. Um, if this baby then grew up in Stone Age time, there was no more access to milk because no supermarket, no cows around. So essentially nature said, well, why should we then waste the energy of building this enzyme? Um, we're, we're, uh, it's important to conserve energy. So uh, evolution gave us an element, a genetic element that turned off this gene with increasing age of the person. So the older this caveman got, the more the gene turned off and no more enzyme was produced. In the Stone Age, no problem because there was no lactose anyway. So this conserved energy. If you now had a time machine and traveled back to this person um, and gave him a carton of milk from the supermarket, he might think um, it's, it could be a good idea to drink this milk. So what would happen is lactose ends up in his intestine there's no enzyme that digests it. And then bacteria think, hey, great, that's a very good source of uh, energy. And bacteria would start to metabolize lactose into uh, gases and acids and cause very severe digestive problems. And this is what we today call lactose intolerance. So actually this, this caveman is a, is a person who's lactose intolerant. So he would not thank you for giving him the carton of milk because it made him very ill. So the normal ancient programming that we have in our genes is to produce a lot of this lactase enzyme at birth and then because we need it and then the production shuts down. And this is progressive. It could be quite fast. In some people it happens at the age of six. Um, in some, it takes up to 80 years, but generally what, what happens is that the production goes down and if you keep eating uh, dairy products or drinking milk, you become more and more lactose intolerant. Um, so this is the normal ancient um, 
um, ancient um, programming. And then around 7,500 years ago, something new happened. Uh, we had, uh, by that time, we had uh, domesticated animals. So we suddenly had access to milk as grown-ups. However, remember, we were still lactose intolerant, so nobody was drinking the milk at that time. And then a genetic mutation happened. So it's essentially a, uh, an error. Uh, the, the gene itself was changed, so one of the genetic letters has changed in one person. And what happened is not the gene was destroyed, but the switching off mechanism was destroyed through this error. So what happened in this grown-up is suddenly he was producing the enzyme just like a newborn baby. And he was the first person who was able to tolerate lactose in that way. And if he now had access, if he now did drink the milk from the domesticated animals, he could digest it just like a baby. So he had uh, he didn't have any bad symptoms and so just like a baby he kept producing the enzyme now five out of six people in europe now have this mutation so it's a lot more common than the ancestral type so why is this why is this new mutation so common and people think the following happened uh, we know that this was a very tough time so a lot of people um, um, starved to death and it is thought that this one person had one advantage. He had one extra uh, source of, uh, of food. So he could drink milk and, and eat dairy. And he was able to, to um, eat this food and also his children inherited this mutation. And now we know that around 80% of Caucasian Europeans are direct descendants from this one person. This happened somewhere in the region of Sweden. We, we know that because Sweden has the highest level of lactose tolerance so the new mutation and the further you go down south in europe the, the more rare it comes so so this happened in europe and since europeans were quite aggressive in traveling and colonizing the world they brought this genetic mutation to the rest of the world but in africa and asia still almost 100 percent are lactose intolerant so this is a little bit <clears throat> a little bit of uh, human evolution that happened there. So uh, the question is, is nutrigenetics eating according to our genes really something of the future? And I think I, I could have showed, uh, showed you that this is something that is as old as humanity. So this is a very clear way. So you drink milk, you feel bad. Um, this is a quite fast way of detecting that your genes are not compatible with your food. Um, with modern technologies, we can now uh, go a lot deeper. And this is, um, this is a curve of the publication. So um, some of you might have heard of the database called PubMed. So essentially all scientific publications on PubMed, um, uh, all scientific publications on life sciences are published on PubMed. So there are around 26 million publications to date. And around 3.5 million are already on the topic of genetics and around 5,000 are on the field of nutrigenetics or gene diet interactions. And this is something that is growing exponentially. So we do learn a lot and we already have a lot of information about genetic effects uh, with diseases as well as nutrition. And this area of gene diet interactions and nutrigenetics is something that uh, is of particular interest um, to me and hopefully you. So what can we do with this information? Um, you all have seen this before. And this is the food pyramid and it's a very honest and well, very well-intentioned instruction of how to eat healthy. So essentially uh, fats and sweets only uh, occasionally in small amounts, um, dairy products, three servings per day, um, gluten containing products, so, so cereal products several times per day. And the more we learn about genetics, the more we see that there are exceptions. So, for example, uh, three servings of dairy products a day is a good source of calcium. It's a good idea, but not for those around 10%, 20%, depending on the population, uh, that are lactose intolerant. So they should eat uh, lactose-free dairy products or other sources of calcium. So that's the first exception. Next one, uh, cereal products, uh, several times per day. Um, not for those who are genetically gluten intolerant or have celiac disease. So there's another exception. And then red meat is a good source of iron. That's true for some people with iron deficiency, 
However, certain genes lead to an excessive iron uptake and that, um, that can cause uh, a disease called hemochromatosis, so iron overload disorder. So those people should not eat iron-containing foods and actually eat less of that. So by just looking at four different genes, uh, in this example, we already found three exceptions to the rule of normal nutrition. And the reality is, the more we look into nutrigenetics, the more we find that um, in reality, nobody fits into this uh, standard recommendation anymore. This is an overview of all of the genes that currently, in our opinion, or my opinion, have reached a certain level of scientific credibility uh, where they interact with certain nutrients. So this is a, a panel of nutrigenetic genes and they do influence things like heart health, oxidative stress, cognitive health, bone health, and so on. Um, there are a lot of good stories about all of them. Um, however, we don't have time. I'm just going to pick out a few genes and show you how they actually influence our nutrient need. The probably best known gene in the field of nutrigenetics is the gene MTHFR. And uh, this is what happens. So folic acid is a quite common nutritional supplement. It's also fortified in foods because generally the general public agrees it's important you have enough uh, folic acid, especially during pregnancy. Uh, I think almost every woman who is pregnant is, is supplementing with folic acid. So it is an important molecule that has a lot of healthy functions. The problem is that folic acid itself is not active in the body. So if I eat it through supplements or nutrients uh, or fortified foods, it's still inactive in our body. But that's not a problem because there's a gene called the MTHFR gene, which has the function to convert the inactive folic acid to the active form called 5-MTHF. So uh, folic acid needs a gene to be converted to be healthy. Now, some people um, do have two mutated versions of this gene. And you can see this number here. So it's 9% of the population. Uh, have very ineffective versions of this gene. So what happens is they, they uh, ingest folic acid, it remains inactive, it cannot be activated, and uh, folic acid uh, remains without effect. So what can you do if you have this genetic variation? Folic acid obviously is not the solution. However, there's the active form that you can already supplement with. Um, certain foods have it, but it's quite unstable when you cook it. So um, supplementation is a, um, is a quite effective way of how to make sure you do get enough of this. So if you already supplement with the active form, you still get the health effect. So depending on your status of the MTHFR gene, uh, there are different recommendations of what nutrients uh, or what supplementation you should be following. Now, I do need to talk about science a little bit, so you know it exists. Um, so this has been studied quite well. So in 2014, there was a meta study. So one study that consists of many different studies that studied 227,000 people. And they found the following. If you have a mutated MTHFR gene, so a broken MTHFR gene, folic acid remains inactive. And this leads to folate deficiency, or at least a very high likelihood of folate deficiency. And this has been shown in this meta study. Um, Clerk has shown the same in 23,000 people, Holmes in 60,000 people, Casas in 13,000 people, and so on. And uh, last time I checked, I found 297 peer-reviewed studies on PubMed, all independent studies that have looked at uh, in total more than 300,000 subjects and have shown this link. So if you have a mutated gene, folic acid is not going to work and you're likely to be folate deficient. Um, then you might ask for the gold standard in studies, and that uh, for, for uh, supplements is a placebo control study. Um, essentially, what, what happens is you either get the nutrient or you get a tic tac, uh, so and something that doesn't contain it, and then you look at the difference. So, uh, this makes sure you don't have any bias by the, by the scientist that is doing this. And uh, in 2018, a quite big study of 2,300 people was, uh, was published that showed that um, if you have normal versions of the MTHFR gene, folic acid can be converted 
also the 5-MTHF is functional, of course, because folic acid is converted into it. And vitamin B2 doesn't have any effect on folic metabolism. However, if you have the genetic mutation for the genetic variation, folic acid uh, is not functional. So you need to supplement with the active form and suddenly vitamin B2 is also beneficial. So quite interesting what they have shown. And then Wilson has shown the same in a placebo study, McNulty has shown it and so on. In total, we have 11 placebo studies on PubMed studying more than 6,300 different subjects. So this was one gene and I think I, I could show that there is, uh, people do react differently to folic acid and choosing the right type of folate is dependent on the function of the MTHFR gene, which we can detect through a genetic test. Another good example is the NQ01 gene. So coenzyme Q10 is uh, a great substance. Um, essentially our body produces it itself, but it's also available as a supplement and uh, a lot of beauty creams use it. And uh, one of the reasons is while coenzyme Q10 doesn't actually have an effect in the body itself, again, there is a gene called NQ01, which converts it into the active form called ubiquinol. And this is then a strong antioxidant. So this means uh, it neutralizes waste products from our metabolism that would otherwise cause a lot of damage and are one of the main causes of aging. So it's an important process, and this is also why the body does produce it itself, uh, even though production goes down with increasing age. So it's a great molecule. Um, the problem is that some people, 6% of the population, have broken versions of this gene. So what happens is you supplement with Q10. If you now did a blood test, and remember before I said, is this true? Having normal amounts, is this sufficient? Um, if you did a blood test, it would say high levels of Q10, everything's fine. The reality is it's not functional. So you really need genetic data to find out is this the right molecule, the right substance to use to reach my goal? And in this case, uh, no, it is not. So what can you do? You can either supplement with the already active form or you can uh, supplement or increase your intake through diet of other substances that have a similar function. And uh, those are vitamin C, vitamin E, alpha lipoic acid, and so on. So again, depending on the genetics, Q10 might be a good product uh, or a good substance to use, or you might use other antioxidants and a higher dose to reach the same goal. And uh, another example, vitamin D, a vitamin D receptor. Um, Vitamin D is produced in, uh, by the skin. So if you go out into the sunlight, your body starts producing vitamin D. However, it needs a way of measuring if there is enough vitamin D. Now, in a very simplified way, uh, you can imagine it like this. The, the gene, the vitamin D receptor gene, makes these green arms, and these sit on the surface of cells, and vitamin D has the right shape to dock onto these receptors. And when this happens, the receptor sends a signal to the cell and essentially says, okay, we've got enough vitamin D, do something healthy. So having deficiency in vitamin D, so too low levels is bad because then this healthy effect doesn't happen. Uh, so far so good, but some people have a genetic variation in this gene. So this green, uh, this green arm thing is not built in the right way. It can still recognize vitamin D and still send the signal, but it's a lot less efficient. So what scientists have found, even normal amounts of vitamin D do not create a strong enough signal to, um, to create the healthy effects of vitamin D. And uh, what other studies have found is if you then increase the amount of vitamin D to a higher level, you activate enough of these less effective receptors to get the same uh, result. So depending on your genetics, a normal amount, this on the right hand side, a normal amount of vitamin D might be uh, sufficient. Or if you have a genetic variation, then you might need higher amounts. So you shouldn't be in the norm. You should be on the top range, top level of the norm to make sure you are not deficient in vitamin D. Um, next example, GPX1. It's also an interesting gene. So uh, the GPX1 gene contains the instructions of how to build the GPX1 protein. And this is a so-called selenoprotein, which means it needs the trace element selenium. 
from diet. So selenium is integrated into this enzyme and then it has a function. And it, again, it recognizes certain free radicals of toxic molecules that our body produces that need to be removed before they do any damage. So with selenium, you produce this and then the free radical comes along and is broken into smaller pieces. And, um, um, and so if you are selenium deficient, this doesn't happen. So you should have enough selenium. Now there are some people again, which have a genetic error in this gene, genetic variation. And what happens is the instructions of how it is built are slightly different. So you see this red thing here. It still needs selenium to be built and it still recognizes free radicals, but the uh, efficiency of this process is a lot lower. So even with a normal amount of selenium, you end up with a lower protection against these free radicals through this genetic error that you have inherited. So you only have low activity, even though you're not deficient in selenium. And again, scientists have found out if you increase the amount of selenium, you produce so many more of these less efficient enzymes that in the end you have the same protective function. So again, based on genetics, you would need more and a blood test would only tell you, are you in the norm? Yes or no. So this is only half the story. Um, this is a little overview of, of genetics. So um, I'll explain this to you. This is the GPX1 gene. 67% of Caucasians have uh, the good version. So they have good protection against oxidative stress. 26% have one functional and one broken copy, one less effective copy. So they have lower protection against oxidative stress and 7% have two of those broken copies and uh, they need significantly more selenium for the same thing. And down here you see individual studies um, that, uh, that, that prove this. Um, a, a little background in the field of medical genetics. So um, my lab is a medical genetic testing lab. There's a, a minimum of scientific evidence that you need to make a certain claim. And that is you need at least three different scientific studies done by three different scientists on three different groups of people. And if they all find the same thing, then apparently it's replicable. And then you can say, okay, now this is scientifically valid enough to warrant testing. And then you need to ask yourself the question if it does make sense to know about this information. So, um, so and this is why I said these 52 genes um, um, have enough science. So they have at least three studies, but as you've seen, some of them have uh, several hundred studies. Um, one of the, I think that's the last example, um, the HFE gene. This gene controls how much iron we absorb from food. So typically what happens, you, you, eat, uh, you eat a diet and it, it contains a certain amount of iron, but the HFE gene makes sure you only absorb a small amount of it. So you eat a steak and the body decides, okay, let's absorb a little bit of iron, but most of it actually goes through and ends up in the toilet. So this is a very, very stringent regulation because, um, we don't have a way of getting rid of iron, so we just regulate it by how much we, we absorb. But one in 200 people, in 200 Caucasians, has a genetic variation in this gene. So this gene doesn't work correctly. And what happens is the body absorbs way too much iron from food. Now, this is a predisposition to a disease called hemochromatosis, this iron overload disorder. And... Uh, Contrary to people who are iron deficient, they tend to store more and more iron in the body. So the recommendation for them definitely is to avoid high iron food and more importantly, do not supplement with iron. So this is actually a case where one in 200 people, so pretty much three, three people in everybody's group of acquaintances that he knows, typically two to three people, um, they should not be uh, supplementing with a standard multi-mineral product because they would actually harm themselves. So um, this is a very good example of where a genetic test uh, gives you information of what kind of nutrients you should avoid. And this is really something you can only get from genetics with lifestyle. Nobody knows about their tendency to, um, to absorb more iron. So this is uh, where you get a lot of information. Uh, final example is the APOA1 gene. Um, 
there, this gene in combination, so if this, if this gene works normally and you combine it with omega-3 fatty acid supplementation, so fish oil capsules, what you would find is that it tends to improve cholesterol. One of the reasons why nutritionists and doctors often uh, recommend to supplement with fish oil or other sources of omega-3 fatty acids to improve um, cholesterol if they have high cholesterol. So, so far, so good. However, a certain percent of the population, and I'm one of them, unfortunately, um, they have a, a different version of this gene. And if they then supplement with omega-3 fatty acids, it actually has the opposite effect. So it actually reduces uh, HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol. So depending on your genetics, you might be helping yourself with uh, with a certain supplement or you might be harming yourself. So what can you do if, if you're here? Uh, it just means do not uh, supplement with extra omega-3, but there are other substances such as phytosterols, which might be a good idea uh, to achieve the same thing. So again, based on your genetics, something might be a good or a bad influence in you. So uh, these were a few examples. Um, as I said, there are 52 genes so far and there will be more in the future. Um, and it is only a very short overview of, of the principle of what kind of extra information you can get from, um, from uh, a genetic test. So when we look into the market, there are, um, again, looking at lifestyle genetics and blood levels, the three main areas where people do differ. Um, there are some companies, great companies, by the way. Um, I, I'm in favor of every company that does uh, go into the personalization space. So Kerov uh, is, is a very well-known one, Persona and Sentiments. They all um, either let you choose what kind of nutrients you want or they base it on a lifestyle questionnaire. So um, th that's a good approach of trying to personalize it more. And there's a company called Bayes and they focus on blood levels. So they look for deficiencies and in those cases, they, they tend to um, increase that personalization. Um, uh, also, I need to say, this is what I found from a quick uh, web search. So please excuse if I'm, I might be missing a few details here. Uh, there's a company called Vitagene, which actually does a combination of lifestyle and genetics. Um, so looking at both those, and, and then there's routine and vital, so I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this, that look at all of these areas. So all companies are going the right direction, um, and I'm happy that they are, they're doing their, uh, their job in, uh, in telling the population that everybody's needs are different, which is definitely true. So different companies different ways of how people differ. So the next question is, how can you then personalize a supplement? And there are different types of delivery methods. And I just want to talk through all of them uh, to make sure that, uh, yeah, you know what's important and what to look out for in personalization. So the most straightforward and easiest and probably cheapest way is to use pills. So based on a questionnaire or whatever personalization, you give someone a green pill and a red pill or just a green pill or a yellow pill and so on. So essentially you choose which kind of pills to put into a person's mix. That's one, uh, one approach. Another one is capsules. So in that case, what you would do is you create a unique blend of powders. So you add all of the nutrients that a person needs and mix it together and then you fill it into capsules and these are then quite convenient to take. Another solution are liquids. So um, that's a quite easy solution. You just dissolve the nutrients in your liquid, mix it together, and the person then takes uh, one sip of this every day. Um, powders is another solution. So again, you blend different powders together and you have a spoon and you take your spoon and uh, dissolve it in water. And then there's also, also something called microbeads um, where you would uh, essentially package every nutrient into a certain small pellet, small microbead, um, and you just mix different amounts of these microbeads together to create the unique mixture. Now let's look at some of the challenges when uh, supplying nutrients. Um, one of the biggest problems in supplement manufacture is that nutrients don't tend to like each other. So essentially when you mix a vitamin and a mineral together, they react and usually the vitamin loses, so the mineral breaks down the vitamin. Um, this is a quite 
tricky thing because for one thing you're you're supplying a supplement that doesn't do what it what it needs to also uh, what is in there is no longer what is uh, written on the box or on the bottle so this is a, a critical problem that you need to avoid now um, pills are actually quite good solution for this because you just put vitamins in one pill and minerals in another so uh, a different selection of pills is a very good way of handling this Capsules is a little more difficult because uh, you mix the powders together. So micro uh, vitamins and minerals would be in the same mix in close contact. However, in a dry uh, situation, so essentially they wouldn't react with each other um, very intensively. It's not optimal, but it's, it's doable. Liquids is uh, definitely a very bad way of handling this because in the liquid form, in the dissolved form, vitamins and minerals are are brilliantly reacting with each other so this is the most the best medium for them to interact so usually when you create liquid vitamins you really need to restrict yourself to certain nutrients that can actually uh, that are compatible so you're restricted there uh, and they tend to react and um, that really reduces the shelf life significantly if it's even stable there. Uh, powders, again, uh, they're in close contact, but, um, but not in liquid, so they react uh, a little bit. And microbeads, again, just like the pills, have the possibility to just keep them in separate microbeads without physical contact, so they can't react. So that's one important aspect. The next one is nutrients are, uh, can taste really horribly. Um, certain vitamins are really bad in taste, iron, for example. And uh, again, pills can handle this quite well. You can coat them even in sugar and um, you can mask the taste. So that's not an issue. Capsules as well. So the nasty tasting powders are packaged behind a gelatin uh, coating. So you can swallow it and that's not an issue. Liquids, again, is the worst form because uh, liquid vitamins, like dissolved vitamins, have a very strong and uh, often unpleasant taste unless you restrict yourself to the ones um, that are not tasting too bad. Um, powders need to be soft, dissolved in liquid before you take them, so same taste problem. And microbeads, again, can be encapsulated, so uh, what you can also do is cover it in a layer of, um, of wax, which masks the taste, so, so the taste can't actually uh, get out of the microbeads. Then um, the problem of stability. So obviously you don't want bacteria or fungi or any microorganisms to grow in there and uh, spoil your product. And uh, pills can handle this quite well because you produce them in a sterile environment and uh, it's dry. Essentially dryness with, without liquid is a very good way of keeping things uh, sterile and preventing bacteria to grow. Capsules is the same thing. Dry powder in capsules, um, not an issue. Again, liquids is problematic because a solution with a lot of nutrients in it is the perfect medium for bacteria to grow. So you usually need a preservative or you have a very, very short shelf life. Powders again are dry and microbeads are dry as well. So, so this is, um, this is um, all of these except for liquids are quite good for bacteriology stability. Then there is the problem of uptake inhibition. Um, you might have heard that uh, you shouldn't be taking calcium and zinc at the same time because um, you, you should take calcium in the morning and zinc after, after lunch. The reason is that you usually would take several hundred or thousand milligrams of calcium because that's just the, the, the dose that you would need and only a few milligrams of zinc. Now, calcium and zinc use the same uptake channels from your intestine into the bloodstream. So if you take both of them and you have a lot more calcium, what tends to happen is calcium blocks the uptake of zinc. So you absorb the calcium, but hardly any, any of the zinc. Um, this is an issue. And this is an issue that pills haven't solved because you have two different types of pills. They go into your stomach, they, uh, they go to the small intestine, they release the nutrients at the same time at a high dose, uh, usually very quickly, and they tend to interact with each other. Capsules have the same issue because essentially once the gelatin capsule has dissolved, they release the nutrients um, and um, you have this inhibition. Liquids as well, there's, uh, there's no, no way of, of solving this and the same for powders. And this is actually where microbeads are probably the best solution. 
And that is, you just put calcium in, a, in one microbead and zinc in another one. And what you can do is make sure that they, they end up in different areas of the intestine. They release, uh, release very small amounts of the nutrients over a very long time. And uh, this would then make sure that calcium is taken up in one part of the intestine and sink in another part. So they are physically apart from each other and you make sure that you have bioavailability for both. So this is something um, where I think microbeads are the best solution. And then there's a concept of sustained release. Um, this isn't really an issue for most vitamins because we have a way of storing them in our body but particularly vitamin C is a problem here. If you were to take 80 milligrams of vitamin C and inject it into someone's bloodstream, you would have 80 milligrams in the body. But uh, vitamin C has a half-life of 30 minutes. That means within 30 minutes, your body will have broken down half of it. So you're down to 40. Then with another half an hour, you're down to 20. And so um, you, you have the amount of vitamin C you have in, in your body. And the uh, that means you have an overdose at the beginning, you're, very, uh, you're in the optimal range for a very short time, and then in the end you're, you're below the amount that you should be. So one way to get around this is to use a concept of sustained release. So you essentially want to release small amounts over a longer period of time, and that way you try to stay in the optimal range for longer. Now, pills have mastered this. So there are sustained release, slow release pills. Uh, there are even some companies which 3D print pills to make sure that this is happening uh, at specific times. So uh, that's a good solution. They can make sure it's uh, slowly released. Capsules have mastered this because, again, once the capsule is dissolved, all of the nutrients are released at once. Liquids, another issue. Uh, liquid versions are very bioavailable. Uh, available, so that's appears to be good but that just means you get all of it into your bloodstream very quickly and you you run into this problem uh, powders can't do uh, sustained release but microbeads can be created so that they release the nutrients over 12 hours um, good and then finally the cost of personalization obviously it must be um, must be viable it must be you must be able to afford it and pills is definitely the easiest solution so you pre-manufacture pills and then uh, there are some simple machines which essentially count the different amounts and put them into a bag um, and you get your individual pill mix so that's a very cheap uh, cheap option liquids is also quite easy there are the great robots that can mix different different liquids together um, also, what you get is every sip is identical to every other sip uh, or little cup because it's a very homogeneous mixture. That's, that's very good about liquids um, if there weren't all of the other issues. Um, powders are a little more difficult because you really need to make sure that you don't mix a powder with very big granules with a powder with small granules because then you start to get a demixing. And if you have a tub and you have all of the small granules go down to the bottom and the big ones to the top, you, uh, in the worst case, end up with an overdose because um, certain nutrients have collected in one area of the, of the tub. So you really need to use certain powders and also personalization is not so simple. So it's a little more expensive. Uh, microbeads is even more expensive because every individual ingredient needs to be packaged into these little microbeads, which then need to be coated and, and slow release technology and so on. So that certainly is a lot more complicated and a lot more expensive than uh, other options. And the only, only thing that I think is more expensive is actually packaging personalized powders into capsules because I'm not aware of a machine that can actually do this uh, without having cross-contamination. So that's the, the most expensive approach. So uh, looking at all of these, um, certainly personalization is uh, here to stay. It's something that we see in all sorts of areas. You personalize your car, you personalize your trainers and so on. And so personalization is here to stay. I'm, I'm sure about it. And I'm very happy that there are lots of companies that uh, create awareness of the need of different approaches. And as I've explained, there are there are good parts and bad parts, but every kind of delivery method uh, that can be done. And yes, yeah, so essentially, I hope I could give you a short overview of the different aspects of personalization, as well as um, uh, the role that genes can actually play. 
And um, yeah, so if you have any, any questions, uh, two options, uh, you can write it in the chat. And alternatively, here's, here's the email address. So you can send us emails and uh, I can make sure that you get the answer to your questions.